Chapter 29-35 When the vault door opened to reveal the hidden treasure, there was a goodly sum of gold coins piled up. How much is there, Hagrid? I don't rightly know Harry, enough to last you through Hogwarts at any rate. To Chad's practice treasure appraising eye, thanks to his many piles of loot, there seemed to be around five to six thousand galleons, a goodly sum for the stingy old bastard to part with. It brought a smile to his face as he imagined the notoriously cheap Dumbledore scraping together this gold just to cover his arse. Imagine not even giving a child money for food or presents for ten years and having the audacity to say you care for the said child. Chad wished he could simply take it all and mention that it would refill because it was a trust fund vault, but that would raise the Dark Lord's suspicion. Much better to only take 500 galleons and seem like a greedy orphan seeing money for the first time. Blimey Harry, I don't think you need that much gold. Hagrid exclaimed as Chad took out a cloth sack he prepared for the occasion and filled it to the brim. I've never had any money of my own Hagrid, and I can't keep coming back here to get more. Besides, I'm tired of never getting anything. Your birthday cake was the first present I've ever received, now I'm going to buy my own. Hagrid wiped a tear from his eye as he muttered about not slapping those damn muggles enough. Chad passed the sack over to Hagrid to hold for him, as it was quite awkward for his small child body to carry around, but easily fit into one of the half-giant's overcoat pockets. He was not worried that Hagrid would steal any of it as he seemed too kind, plus even if he did, it wasn't Chad's money anyway and didn't matter. Another quick stop to Vault 713 to pick up the supposed Philosopher's Stone, and they were ready to do some shopping. The first stop was to purchase a trunk after he asked Hagrid how they would carry everything they bought or take it to Hogwarts. Chad didn't get a deluxe custom-made trunk as everything he purchased now would be scrutinized by Dumbledore. Besides, he already had a few made up years ago. But his school trunk was still tricked out to make his life more comfortable. It had built-in featherweight and shrinking charms as well as a couple of expanded partitions finished with a dark mahogany exterior. Hogwarts school trunks, like the majority of wizarding luggage, were issued with capacity-enhancing or extension charms as standard. The extension charm is advanced, but subject to strict control, because of its potential misuse. The Ministry of Magic had therefore laid down a strict rule that capacity enhancement is not for private use, but only for the production of objects, such as school trunks and family tents, which have been individually approved for manufacture by the relevant ministry department. Hermione was breaking the law when she expanded her book bag and could have been prosecuted if Slytherin actually had any cunning people in it. Hagrid didn't let Harry buy a different cauldron in canon, mentioning that it wasn't on the list, but Chad managed to get at least the top of the line of everything he needed thanks to his early sob story of being neglected and his influence over Hagrid's mind. He got a beautiful set of silver scales for precisely weighing potion ingredients, though he wondered why he couldn't use Muggle Kitchen mechanical scales. A collapsible gold telescope was next to be purchased after the shop owner assured him it was by far better than the brass model or anything a Muggle could make. Then it was off to the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell. An assortment of herbs, dried roots, and bright powders lining the walls, bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung from the ceiling. Once again Chad bought the best quality potion tools like crystal files with unbreakable charms and the freshest ingredients the store had for desirable results when potion making. Chad opted to leave getting fitted for his robes until last when he saw a child that could only be Draco Malfoy through the window of Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Hagrid, seeing no reason to refuse, sent him to Ollivander's to get his wand while he went off to search for an animal for Harry's birthday present. Entering the shabby store that was in desperate need of a renovation, it was a tiny place, empty except for a single chair for waiting and a counter to serve customers. Behind the wooden table was thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. Good afternoon, said a soft voice, the creepy bastard suddenly appearing from behind one of the piles of boxes. It still made Chad jump somewhat even though he was expecting it. Chad was surprised when he didn't sense a mind probe from the disturbing old man that looked like a stereotypical pedophile. Especially when Ollivander greeted him by name. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes. I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. It wasn't creepy at all talking about a stranger's eyes he got from his dead mother and then describing her wand. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches. Pliable. A little more power and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favored it, but it's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. 
J.K. Rowling summed up the wand maker pretty well when she described Harry's first meeting with him. An old man was standing before him, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Whether they were shinning with sexual desire at seeing a young boy walk into his shop after playing with his wand all day, or excitement at the chance of selling another wand, Chad didn't know. Since the old wand maker didn't use legitimacy on him, he must be very skilled at a clemency to remember every wand he ever sold, this stopped Chad from attempting to peer into his no-doubt disturbed mind. Before the creepy old bastard could invade Chad's personal space and go on about Voldemort and his wand, he spoke up asking for one of his own. Ah, yes. I'm here to buy a wand if you don't mind. Sort of on a tight schedule. Well, okay. Let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? I'm right-handed, he replied. Hold out your arm. That's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit and round his head. As Ollivander measured, he spoke about the different cores he used and the poor results Chad would get when using another's wand. Right then, Mr. Potter. Try this one. Beechwood and Dragon Heartstring. 9 inches. Nice and flexible, just take it and give it a wave. Ollivander announced as he handed him a stick. The magical tape measure that had been operating autonomously suddenly crumpled to the floor, apparently no longer needed. With disastrous results that caused property damage, Chad wondered why the old codger didn't have a testing room for reactions like this. It would save him a lot of money, particularly when he sold the most important instrument a wizard used so cheaply. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder, yes, why not? An unusual combination of holly and phoenix feather, 11 inches, nice and supple. It was as if the old pervert had been building up to this moment all along. When Chad felt a sudden warmth from the offered wand, he raised the wand above his head and brought it swishing down through the dusty air. A stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like fireworks, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. What a joke, things had gone exactly as the book even though Chad was utterly different from Harry Potter as night was from day. Maybe it was Voldemort's influence. No, Harry had part of his soul in his head, while Chad had purified it and then assimilated it, erasing any trace of influence from it. Mr. Ollivander cried, oh, bravo. Yes, indeed, oh, very good. Well, 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 how curious, how very curious. He put the wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, curious, curious. Sorry, Chad responded, playing along, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed him with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather, just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why its brother gave you that scar. Yes, thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. This moment was why Chad had wanted Hagrid off doing something else. I'm sorry, but are you trying to sell me the same wand you sold the lunatic that killed my parents? The wizard that is still so feared people can't even say his name, and you want to sell me his brother wand? Are you insane? Taken aback by the vitriol in Chad's voice, Ollivander was momentarily stunned. He barely was able to utter out an excuse. The wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. If the wand chooses the wizard, why did you waste my time with all that measuring? Is the length of my legs or the circumference of my head going to guide you to a wand that will somehow be compatible? What difference does it make if I'm left-handed or not? If compatibility is such an issue, why don't you make custom ones? These pre-made wands would not compare to one that had all of its properties tailor-made for a customer. Chad fired back at the old charlatan. Best wand maker, my arse. He thought to himself as he looked at the wide-eyed gaping visage of the old wand stroker. Was Chad overthinking Ollivander's skill at acclimacy? Had he never been questioned about his methods or wand quality and been shocked enough for it to fail? Everyone did seem to think this place was better than any other wand maker. Did someone put you up to this? Sell the wizarding hero that defeated he who must not be named the same wand so they can run off to the daily prophet to make some galleons off my destroyed reputation? Who is it? 
Chad shouted furiously. It was a bit of a gamble exposing a small amount of magical world awareness to Ollivander, but Chad was pretty sure Dumbledore did not go around sharing how he raised Harry Potter. I'm sorry, Mr. Potter, it was not my intention to besmirch your good name. But even though all my wands are pre-made, they are of the highest quality, I can assure you. I noticed you didn't justify the parlor tricks with measuring, pointless questions and my parents' wand properties. Or that a custom wand would be superior to a random pre-made one. You also failed to say if you were acting under someone else's orders, maybe it was only your plan all along? The pervert's eyes widened further at each new accusation. So much so that Chad thought his eyes were either going to burst or fall out of his head. What do you think would happen if I go to the Daily Prophet first and spin a story of the orphan hero being forced into becoming a dark lord by the deviate wand maker that gets his jollies from scaring his clients? Maybe you even did the same for he who must not be named, after all, the wand chooses the wizard, but you are the one that has complete control over the process and makes the rules. I wonder what your competitors would think of your so-called methods and reputation as the finest wand maker alive. I'm sure they would be more than happy to be endorsed by Harry Potter, the savior of the wizarding world, and explain how full of sh asterisk t you are. Other than some strange noises, Ollivander had yet to voice an excuse or rebuttal. He was also now sweating bullets. But suddenly, his fearful expression morphed into a cold and calculating one. He flicked his arm out, and a wand launched from a hidden holster towards his waiting grasp. It was then three ninja elves beat the stuffing out of him while Chad telekinetically stole his wand. It seems that potential damage to his reputation had provoked Ollivander's mental discipline to once again assert itself. Who knows what the old creeper had in mind to fix the situation. The sign outside the wand shop Ollivander's, makers of fine wands since 382 BC, indicated just how long it had been operating. Anything from this era, when wizards were powerful and ruthless, suggested at the likelihood of severe protection wards that might be placed on it. Thankfully, Voldemort had been something of a prodigy at wards and disarming, bypassing, or breaking them was his bread and butter. It was thanks to this knowledge that Chad had known of the anti-house elf protection, as the place had been around since they were more common. Surprisingly, the only other wards he discovered were the necessary protection against theft, operating, fire, and damage. There didn't appear to be anything offensive or any detection wards to identify those that entered or prevent illusions. It seems that no one cared about disguised patrons if they were spending good coin. Or the Ministry of Magic had nerfed them in their crusade against dark magic. But the anti-house elf protection ward only prevented their unique mode of teleportation in or out of the building. It did not stop them from being able to enter normally or restrict the ability to use their magic once they were inside. Otherwise, they would be unable to do their duty as servants. Which was why Chad had Boppy and his ninjas following him closely when he entered the shop. After all, it is the mark of an excellent house elf to do their work, but their existence is not even noticed. Chad had been surprised at Ollivander's outburst. He had pegged the old fool as a coward since a few hard questions caused him to gasp like a fish out of water. Looking down at the beaten and unconscious man thanks to his elves, Chad hesitated. He really didn't want to peer into Ollivander's mind, afraid of what he would see. It was similar to brainwashing Sapphire and her friends with their memories of hardcore granny porn, but at least he could wipe their minds without having to scan through it. He needed Ollivanders for his wand-making skills. Gritting his teeth, he dived into what was hopefully not a pedophile's mind. He was immediately greeted to the site of a castle situated in the middle of a field of green grass. This was the twelfth time Chad had seen this style of acclimacy defense and was curious if Ollivander would fare any better than the others. It was as if they had all read the same book and taken the castle defense example as the best way to defend their mind. No modern ideas were applied at all. Yep, here come the dragons. How predictable. He thought to himself as he summoned his own attackers. Even using the most dreaded dragon, the Hungarian Horntail, paled in comparison to 50 enclave soldiers in power armor with anti-material rifles. Sure, dragons are giant, magic-resistant, flying fire-breathing reptilian beasts, widely regarded as the most terrifying and awe-inspiring creatures. But that was against wizards and muggles using swords and bows, not modern-day warfare. Anti-material rifles were designed to penetrate tank armor, and even though modern tanks were unaffected due to their more substantial plating, the same could not be said about dragon scales. Before the two dragons could even leave the air above the castle, 50 mentally constructed enclave soldiers fired their deafening anti-tank rifles. The dragon's magically resistant hide slash scale somehow managed to deflect several bullets, but the majority accurately struck, causing fatal amounts of damage. Such a massive target only made it easier for scoped rifles to hit, even if it was moving. 
only one managed to let out a piercing shriek of agony, as the other was killed instantly. They fell as if they were puppets with their strings cut, landing on the castle battlements and causing some structural damage. It amazed Chad every time he attacked a wizard's trained mind when they expected only one intruder. If he could use his willpower to arm himself with any weapon, why could he not also create soldiers like in his own mind? It was all just a visual representation of his will against the enemy's own, why they would limit their creativity was baffling. But then again, that was why the wizarding world had not advanced in centuries, they had no imagination. It was likely the reason why they found it so hard to learn a clemency or legilimency, they had little concept of what was required or believed it too complicated. If you asked a random wizard to influence another's mind with magic, they would probably respond with, it is very advanced magic that only masters could use, and not try. But if you gave a muggle magic and asked him to perform the Jedi mind trick, they would wave their hand and say, these are not the droids you are looking for, with enthusiasm. Magic was using one's will to affect reality. Somehow, specific human souls had gained the ability to do so. Whether it was accidental or through a higher being's machinations, it was possible in this universe and made evident by the fact that only wizards could have ghosts. There was no magical core that accumulated some energy known as magic, you either had it, or you didn't. If there was a magical core, there would have been hundreds of wizards cut open by muggles looking for them in hopes of gaining their power. Chad had experimented with it as soon as he had learned that hard truth and it had made him very powerful. More so after reinforcing his own soul by consuming Voldemort's soul pieces. That was why when he waved his hand, and another 50 Enclave soldiers in power armor holding various weapons appeared, his mental avatar barely dimmed. It was good to be almighty. The new group of soldiers made for the castle as the previous group laid down cover fire. Ollivander at least had the willpower and ingenuity to have 20 wizards with the ability to use as an assortment of spells. The other wizards Chad had fought against had used their avatar as the only wizard defending and preferred to use magical beasts to attack the intruder. Anti-material rifles were not designed to be used as an anti-personnel weapon, but that's not to say they couldn't be. When the 20 defending wizards moved to the walls to fire down upon the advancing futuristic warriors, they were decimated by the long-range rifles designed for tanks. It was not pretty, as the defenders just seemed to explode into meaty chunks for no reason. Ollivander must have filled his underwear witnessing the exotic weapons against his dragons and men. A rocket launcher made entry through the gatehouse simple and then there were all sorts of magical beasts jumping out from different hidey holes. A gigantic Nundu leapt into the courtyard that the gatehouse opened up into, its spike riddled hide looking fearsome as it roared at the intruders. The yard was soon filled with its toxic breath that was fatal to any who had the misfortune to breathe it. But that meant nothing to the advancing troops in their sealed armor designed for post-apocalyptic environments full of radiation. The defiant beast that struck terror into all that witnessed its fearsome appearance was promptly shredded under a hail of machine gun fire. Minigun toting troops cleared hallways, while those with flamethrowers spewed liquid fire into any rooms they passed. Automatic rifles continued to fill the air with death as the soldiers advanced through the castle in their pursuit of Ollivander's mental avatar. It was a systematic slaughter as the troops filled everything that moved with lead or covered it in liquid flame. A few soldiers were taken down by newly spawned wizards using exploding charms, but the Enclave soldiers' teamwork made it a rarity. Soon enough, Ollivander was located in the only place that wasn't on fire, and all the different squads converged on his position. After a few minutes and a couple more soldiers' deaths, a very see-through old ghost was dumped at Chad's feet. Even unconscious Ollivander had put up a decent fight, at least for a wizard. With a further exertion of his mighty will, Chad transfigured the mental representation of Ollivander's mind into a holodisc and then created a vault tech computer to view it with. He had long since learnt not to take it back to his own mind unless he wanted the subject to die. Seconds later and he now had complete access to the old wand cleaner's every thought or memory, even if he had forgotten it or tried to hide it. It was simplicity itself to collect everything on wand making and make a copy for himself to view at his leisure. Now he only needed to condition the old bag of bones into a loyal wand-making minion and have him put his utmost into creating a custom wand. There was also the order to write to Dumbledore and confirm that Harry Potter held the brother wand of Voldemort as planned. Before he left his mind, Chad couldn't help but give in to his curiosity and check if Ollivander was indeed a pervert. Huh, so it was just a very unhealthy obsession with wands, well at least I don't have to cleanse him with fire now after he finished my wand. He thought to himself. Picking up the 11-inch holly and phoenix feather wand, Chad made his way out of the store after fixing the cosmetic damage to Ollivander and getting an elf to wake him up. It was time to meet Hagrid in Elop's Owl Emporium to choose as an owl. 
Hagrid had been like a kid in a candy store as he waited for him, inspecting every owl to make Harry's decision easier when he finally arrived to pick one. Chad had humored Hagrid by listening to him point out faults or list points of interest about each species, but in the end, he had already decided on the only snowy owl in the store. It was pure white without a single black spot marring its feathers, a typical sign that it was a male of the species. Confused, as Hedwig was described as female in canon, he double-checked with his personal animal expert. Hagrid, is this snowy owl male or female? Let me have a look. She's a girl, just been magic to look white. Female snowy owls naturally have black markings, but since they are quite rare in England, pure white owls are more in demand. He helpfully supplied. Magic. Of course. For a second there, Chad had thought that Harry had confused the gender of his owl and given it a girl's name. It would certainly explain why Hedwig was always bashing him around the head with her wings or pecking him. Twenty minutes later, they left Elop's Owl Emporium carrying a large ornate cage housing a majestic pure white snowy owl. Chad had also purchased a top-of-the-line perch and a heap of owl treats for his new owl to enjoy. He was doing his best to spend as much of Dumbledore's money as legitimately possible. As for the name of his new winged minion, Chad was thinking of something other than Hedwig. Sure, it was a German girl's name meaning war or something similar, but he felt it didn't roll off the tongue well enough. With the obsession for erasing the black markings on female snowy owls, Chad thought of purity as a name but dismissed it after chuckling at possible racial connotations. In the end, it was the memory of Hedwig battering Harry that gave him the idea for her name. In In the Old Testament and in Jewish folklore, Lilith is often envisioned as a dangerous demon of the night who attacks children, perfect for a messenger owl in his employ. Any Hogwarts student trying to use his owl will receive a vicious battering and the fact she is nocturnal and hunts down small critters matched perfectly. Plus, Chad liked the name, Lilith. He was happy for the gift, even if he could have bought it himself. Another example of Hagrid's kindness or cunning, depending on how you looked at it. It was actually the first thing Chad looked for when he invaded the sleeping half-giant's mind. He was happy to find out that the lovable bumbling idiot was indeed just that, instead of a ruthlessly calculating person voluntarily in Dumbledore's indentured service. It was a bit of a d asterisk ck move on Harry's part in canon, not to use his newfound wealth to return the favor of Hagrid's gifts. Especially since Hagrid was on a groundskeeper's salary. He couldn't remember a single time Harry bought the half-giant a gift for a birthday or Christmas, even after receiving gifts himself. Rude. With Hagrid carrying the cage with the sleeping owl, they made their way to Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. It was the last stop as everything else had already been purchased by this point. All his clothing was once again of the best quality that a noble could wear proudly, from his winter cloak to his dragon hide protective gloves. Chad exercised some artistic liberty when it came to the plain pointed hat, black, for day wear, on his school list, as he had seen the conical shaped hats in the street and had not been impressed. It looked more like a dunce's cap than a hat fit for a wizard. Since it only listed a plain pointed hat that was black, Chad ordered the closest thing he could see to a Gandalf hat, a simple charm could change its color to suit his needs. He was surprised that Acromantula silk wasn't a thing, as he had his elves stockpiling it for the last few years to sell. Fanon had made it seem like it was a common thing in the Potterverse and Chad was ashamed to say he also took it as gospel. But he was not worried, when he checked the farm on an Australian tour, he had been impressed by its strength and quality. Although it had no magical properties, it would be ideal for clothes and other linen products. With their shopping done, Chad talked Hagrid into lunch at the Leaky Cauldron, his treat for helping him shopping. Getting a private room for some solitude from the Harry Potter admirers was innocent enough and convenient for Chad's plan. It was a simple matter to have Boppy enter disguised as Quirinus Quirrell, shoot some spell-like illusion at Hagrid and put him to sleep with legitimacy. A half-giant had decent spell resistance, but they were just as susceptible to mind magic as any untrained mind. They then had plenty of time to take out the Philosopher's Stone and inspect if it was genuine or not. Surprisingly, the stone Hagrid had been carrying around all day was, in fact, the real deal. Unsurprisingly, it was practically worthless. It was a real philosopher's stone, but it had been depleted of any of its miraculous energy, only having just enough to expose its authenticity unless carefully inspected. No matter, having the genuine article negated any frustration over it being drained of power. It could still be studied to see if it was possible to be replicated or refilled. Chad had a couple of house elves use their overpowered magic to make a copy using the Gemino curse in case he left a magical signature for Dumbledore to identify. They then placed the duplicate back in the original's packaging and slipped it back into Hagrid's coat pocket. 
It would fade and be destroyed eventually, but not for a month or two if he was lucky. If Dumbledore searched Hagrid's memory, he would only be able to blame Quirrell as the culprit. Once Chad edited Hagrid's mind for any errors he may have made in his behavior, they would hopefully be above suspicion. When Hagrid awoke, it was as if he had never been asleep, continuing where he left off in the conversation explaining the glory of Hogwarts. Everything proceeded like canon after their meal, Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Desleys, then handed him an envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, for the 1st of September. King's Cross, it's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Desleys, send me a letter with your owl, she'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Chad waved goodbye then watched Hagrid until he was out of sight. With his shrunken trunk in his pocket now also holding what remained from his spending spree and Lilith in her cage next to him, he couldn't help but smile. He was now free from surveillance and able to enact his plans until he boarded the Hogwarts Express in a month. He would need to transfer the tracking spells back onto Dudley for tonight's operation though. Can't have Dumbledore notice him teleporting to wherever Voldemort's spirit was hiding. The mundane trip home to Little Whinging was quite enjoyable in a relaxing way as he watched the different scenes pass by his window, but the walk home was annoying carrying the cage. Chad remembered to smile as he waved to Mrs. Fig before entering the Desley residence. That old B asterisk TCH was going to get it after he left for Hogwarts, if he hadn't swapped places with Dudley, she would have happily watched while he was worked like a slave. 10 o'clock at night saw Boppy popping into his cupboard to inform him of the ninja team's success at following the idiot Quirrell to his ghostly master. Why he didn't just apparate to the Ministry of Magic and report Voldemort once he was back on English soil, he could not understand. With the old switcheroo of the tracking spells, Chad was off to catch himself a snack of the soul variety as Boppy had already put the prior attack plans into action, not taking any risks. A hundred of his best ninjas had been recalled for this operation as Chad didn't need an angry Voldemort searching for him if they failed. Even if he only had a fraction of his original power, he was still quite capable of making his life hell. As much as Chad laughed and mocked the retarded minor Dark Lord, he was still responsible for the deaths of a lot of people and had diehard fanatics he could call on if he put aside his ego. Arriving a goodly distance away from an old looking house, Chad took note of his surroundings. They appeared to be in a remote forested area in the middle of nowhere since he could see no other lights other than the ones in the house. Maybe this was Quirrell's family home and was warded against muggles. Either way, the isolation would work against Quirrell as no one would be able to hear him cry for help. A ninja emerged out of the darkness and kneeled in front of Chad. He really needed to do something about his night vision. Master, there has been no movement since 15 minutes ago. After the target led us here, he entered the house and then started screaming, we held off in case it was a trap to wait for your orders. The ninja elf informed him. Good work, you were correct in your actions. The target was probably tortured by Voldemort's shade and then possessed. Are there any wards on the house? No, master. There are only basic protection wards against fire and damage. Nothing to stop us. Very well. I want ten of you to pop right next to the target and hit him with the tranquilizer darts, don't worry about overdosing him. Boppy will then pop me in, and we will try to contain the shade from escaping. The rest of the ninjas will spread out and make sure the shade doesn't escape, if they can't stop it, then just follow it. Chad ordered. The main soul of Voldemort was the only variable that could suddenly change in his plans. If Coralmort was somehow tipped off during the school year and disappeared, then there were too many things that could go wrong. The worst case scenario was Voldemort completely cracking and outing the wizarding world with some stupid display of his power. Hopefully, after tonight, he will be gone for good. Chad suddenly appeared in a living room with a seemingly drunken man stumbling around while spraying blood everywhere from an amputated right arm. Firing off a stunning spell at the already mostly incapacitated wizard made the room go quiet. Quirrell had darts sticking out of him from all different places while a severed hand clutching a wand was on the floor a two meters away from the now unconscious wizard. Restrain him, but be careful and don't go near him. Clear everything around him, even his robes. Chad ordered, not caring about the blood flowing at a steady rate from the missing limb. Quirrell was fated to die as soon as he started working for Voldemort. Quirrell was then magically striped, and the sofa near him was magicked away, leaving a naked, bound and bleeding wizard in an empty room. Before Chad could set up a containment field to stop the ghost of Riddle from escaping, a nebulous black form with a screaming face zoomed out of Quirrell's head. Whether it was trying to hurt Chad in revenge from ruining his plans or just a knee-jerk reaction, the Voldemort cloud of creepiness flew at him. 
Chad thought this was an incredibly reckless thing to do because a soul not bound to a body would lose to a wizard any day. Even a wizard not trained in legilimency could hit it with a killing curse or use a shield spell to fend it off. And that's not including the overpowered sacrifice slash love protection that Chad had as Harry Potter from Lily doing her thing. How Voldemort didn't burst into flame and cannon when he flew through Harry after Quirrell crumbled to ash was a mystery. Or how the soul piece in his head could survive, maybe it slipped in before the protection could target it as an enemy. Either way, it was foolish of the minor Dark Lord to come straight at Chad as that was what he wanted him to do. Gathering his will, he dragged the corrupt and tattered soul into his mindscape. Just as before, a snake-faced man in black robes appeared at the outskirts of the apocalyptic town. Chad was not going to take any chances with the main soul of a recognized master of mind magic, not with the extra juice it had compared to the other pieces. Loudspeakers in the raider camp blasted out all examples of Riddle's failures while surprise attacks from both the sky and underground assaulted him. Vertibirds unleashed a hail of bullets down from up high while mole rats tunneled out at his feet to distract him. Deathclaws appeared from behind buildings with their pants shitting aura of death, while super mutants unleashed the destruction of the heavy weapons they favored. Chad had brought out the big guns so to speak, to not only test how they fared against a fully powered Voldemort, but to also end the fight quickly. He was disappointed that the killing curse had no problem killing off the death claws, even with their legendary damage resistance, but was surprised at the success of the weak mole rats. Although they did little damage, the shock of an enemy exploding out of the dirt was enough to distract Voldemort from the real damage dealers. Multiple enemies also forced him to use different spells and get creative with area of effect damage. Energy weapon wielding synths confused him when they survived an Avada Kedavra to the chest, but an exploding charm following it up exposed the mechanical abomination for what it was. With five times the power of the previous soul pieces, it was easy to see how Riddle was able to bulldoze through other wizards' mental defenses, but he was still just as unimaginative. Even though he was aware of muggle weapons and their destructive power, he never used them, probably disdaining them because they were muggle. Instead, he wasted time trying to use spells to destroy the mechanical birds of death high up in the sky. This left him open to other attacks and surprises that chewed up his limited supply of power. Chad had not even expended 40% of his mental energy that represented his willpower, and Riddle was already on his last legs. Sure, he had laid waste to the already dilapidated town above and had killed anything that moved, but he had achieved very little in his goal to find Chad's mental avatar. Destroying every speaker that had him frothing at the mouth in rage at their insults and insinuations also achieved nothing. Inevitably, Voldemort fell to the seemingly endless waves minions as they cost little effort to create. After a run through the vault computer to purge any memory and emotion that contaminated the soul, Chad cut it up into manageable pieces to consume over time. The power boost would still be the same, but the assimilation would be safer and not stress his body or soul to bursting. All in all, a reasonably underwhelming fight, but a safe one. Voldemort had empowered both his body and soul through rituals that gave him the juice to throw around legilimency attacks like they were nothing, but didn't try to improve his techniques or think outside the box. It was also curious that Voldemort never consumed soul pieces like Chad was doing, instead choosing to sacrifice wizards and witches in rituals to claim their power. But just like Chad's method, there was a limit on how much the body or soul could take. The body housed the soul, and if the soul became too great for it to contain, it would burst at the seams. Likewise, a soul could only develop so much before it became unstable or started affecting the mind emotionally. Voldemort's problem was that he never tried to replenish what he kept cutting away or take a break to regain balance and heal. Of course, this could have been Dumbledore's influence, who knows how far that old goat's machinations went. At any rate, Tom Marvolo Riddle had been taken off the board except for three soul pieces in the diary, Hufflepuff's cup and Ravenclaw's diadem. The unconscious quarrel at his feet would disappear, and it would appear as if he successfully stole the Philosopher's Stone and resurrected Voldemort. Since Quirrell had to die to complete the ruse, there was something he could help Chad with before he shuffled off this mortal coil. Chad had been thinking about what he felt from the Philosopher's Stone since he had the pleasure of examining it. With a command to Bopi, he once again scanned it with his senses once it was retrieved from a quarantined magical loot site. Since Chad would need time to experiment with it, he had sealed Quirrell's stump to stop him bleeding to death. After an hour of examination and testing, he was confident he knew how it worked. With all his testing of souls and the power gained from eating them, he now knew why the stone's energy felt familiar. The Philosopher's Stone was made of crystallized life force. To create a stone this size must have taken thousands of souls channeled into it to form and stabilize it. How it was done, Chad had no idea, maybe a ritual of some kind. 
but one thing was sure, there must have been at least a thousand magicals sacrificed to achieve this result. Well, that or a hundred thousand muggles as their souls held less power. Either way, with that massive amount of souls channeled into one place, it was little wonder that Flamel could break the magical rules of creating gold or make potions to restore his life force and extend his lifespan. Flamel was over 600 years old, and in that time, there have been a great many wars. Both muggle and magical. It would be easy for the crafty old bastard to set up a ritual nearby and harvest the souls of the dying. Whether he engineered the wars or just took advantage is debatable, but it was rather cunning of him to claim he used alchemy to create the stone. And the fact that he only was able to create one. Chad supposed that using the stone to turn things into gold was the perfect misdirect, but stupid in the first place for exposing the stone's powers. Maybe he had been found out and needed an excuse. Either way, it shouldn't be too hard to refill the stone eventually, with all the death he planned to reap in his world conquest. There would always be people with armies willing to use force against his figureheads. Particularly since he had moved his operations into Africa. The hard part of creating the stone was already done, now he just had to guide the souls into it as it would automatically absorb them and prevent the energy from dissipating. He hoped. It was a pity the resurrection stone did not function as advertised. Chad was expecting an artifact that would allow him to summon a soul to the world of the living so he could communicate with it but was disappointed when it was merely a memory made corporeal. Less substantial than living bodies, but much more than ghosts, it was as if the stone used the memory of the dead target and channeled magic into giving it form. If the resurrection stone could summon real souls, he would have an unlimited power source. A pity the real stone couldn't even create a ghost of someone you didn't know personally, and they couldn't even speak. Slipping into Quarrel's already damaged mind from Voldemort's takeover, he destroyed any resistance that had recovered and ripped his soul from its anchor. The experimental thugs had given him a lot of experience in this. Then it was a simple matter of using his will to guide it to the Philosopher's Stone and watch as it was sucked into it with a scream of terror and a red glow. Well, now he had a means of getting the most out of his enemies that were not worth enslaving. Go, green. Always recycle. Chad chanted out in a mockery of the environmental movement's slogan. He wondered how they would react if they knew he was recycling souls instead of trash. Well, in a way, he was still recycling trash. Of course, before Chad fed Quarrel's soul to the stone, he cut a piece off for testing. So far, he had only consumed Voldemort's soul pieces and didn't dare experiment with muggle souls in fear of turning himself into a squib. There was also valuable information about Hogwarts and the current staff in Quarrel's memories, not to mention possible loot that might be hidden. Since the bits of Voldemort needed to be stored for a later date and the pressure of holding onto his main soul was worse than a full muggle soul, Chad needed to deal with the sliver he kept of Quarrel quickly. Relevant memories were scanned and transferred into the quarantined pile of holodisks, and the fragment of soul purged of any contaminants that could influence his own soul. Without further ado, the soul remnant that was even smaller than the Voldemort piece that was initially in his head was swallowed. The power boost was negligible because of its size, but much more comfortable to absorb. Maybe he wouldn't have to store Voldemort's butchered soul for very long if he could continue to consume them this easily, he was expecting at least a bit of discomfort by increasing his soul capacity. From the quick scan of Quarrel's memories concerning his wealth, it seems the Quarrel family trusted in their ability to guard their Gringotts key and had no other protections on their bank vault. The key that had been collected when Quarrel had been stripped and was sent off with a house elf to empty the goblin protected strongroom. He just needed to instruct the house elf to change into rags first to not draw attention to himself. With no reason to stay here any longer, Chad had his ninja elves loot the house entirely and then burn it down along with any evidence that may have been left behind. Now, he only had to concentrate on eating bits of soul to take the pressure off from containing another's essence in his mindscape. It was funny how a legitimacy probe would not stifle a mindscape with stress, but a defeated soul remnant could. It probably had to do with the size or being unanchored, since a mind probe was not the complete soul. But anything soul related was guesswork thanks to the purge of any information on the subject. Most likely to stop evil immortal wizards from appearing or threatening the ministry's power. Instead of reapplying Dumbledore's tracking spells, Chad decided to leave them on Dudley for the next couple of days while he enacts his plans before leaving for Hogwarts and being under the direct supervision of the Dark Lord. They were not essential but would make things more manageable in the future regarding Dumbledore's hold over him. But that could be taken care of after he expanded his soul and willpower capacity and relieved the burden of holding onto a foreign soul. Three days later, and a lot more powerful after eating half of the stored Voldemort, Chad decided it was time to act before he ran into unforeseen problems. 
since he was still tracking spell free, he might as well do it now. He already had his elves investigate his target's movements and where they lived. It was just a matter of capturing and brainwashing them. With the orders given to his elite ninjas, he had Bobby pop him to a temporary excavated base for the operation. Ten minutes later saw the first target appear bound and gagged in his sleepwear. There was Rudolf Immersmith, a low-level lackey in the tax department. Although there were many houses concealed from the muggle world, they were not hidden in the magical one. They were required to at least register with the Ministry of Magic for tax purposes and compliance to the Statute of Secrecy. For a community where the majority of jobs were centered around the ministry and had their education and medical care subsidized, they needed accurate tax collecting measures to pay for everything. Even in the magical world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. Since necessary living costs like shelter, utilities, maintenance, and food were nearly non-existent thanks to magic, their only expenses were luxury goods and entertainment. Thanks to their medieval culture and small population, status played a big part in their lives. It made sure that money was pumped into relevant departments to continue a never-ending chain of spending and employment in a world where everyone wanted to be nobility or at least like them. That's where Rudolf Immerset came into it. He was responsible for maintaining the registry detailing assets and income of every wizard and witch. Chad wanted to find out what assets or property the Potter House owned before he was orphaned or if he still held it or not. This low-level pleb was just the guy to check for him without having to go down to the ministry and cause a scene. With no mental defense, Chad programmed him into a loyal minion with orders to find out. The next person to pop in via elf transport was someone responsible for a lot of grief for the original Harry Potter. Rita Skeeter was a British witch and journalist who specialized in writing poison pen stories. These stories tended to be based on false information and misreported interviews while she worked for the Daily Prophet, as well as authoring a few tell-all biographies. You would think that with her ability to acquire information as an unregistered beetle animagus, she would have a lot more truth in her stories. But as much as Chad despised the witch, he had to admit that she was devastatingly effective in tarnishing even the most loved and noblest of characters, like the self-sacrificing Harry Potter, to the sheep of the wizarding world. Chad naturally wanted her on his side before she started actively working against him. Not to mention she was in pretty good shape for a 40-year-old career woman. The blonde-haired, green-eyed woman would make an excellent addition to his team. Particularly after some cosmetic work and fashion changes. Sex appeal worked just as well as spying in some cases, not to mention increasing her follower base with some well-shot wizard photography under her articles. A sexy witch journalist reporting controversial stories would get lots more attention. And since there were only two newspapers in the wizarding world, having a famous journalist on his side would be instrumental to his plans. Rita Skeeter was also vulnerable to mind magic, and being bound and gagged only made it easier to morph her into the perfect media tool to increase his public image. A detailed interview of Harry Potter to be released the day he caught the Hogwarts Express was also added to her mind. An interview about meeting the clueless, yet fascinated orphan exploring Diagon Alley to learn more about his newfound culture will be just what the curious wizard sheep desired. It would be very damaging to those involved with the Potter heir's disappearance from the wizarding world, alluding to a ministry plot to keep the boy ignorant so they could control his legacy. It would also mention how he found out he was a wizard by being bombarded with hundreds of letters and the need for Dumbledore's half-giant to take him shopping. But the most crucial part would be the mention of the still genuine threat against his life. After all, the reason Harry Potter was ripped from the magical world was for his own protection against Voldemort and his Death Eaters. The fact that the Ministry forgot about him and that no Aurors visited him to update him on the current security or threat level would be the icing on the cake. Chad planned to use the excitement about his reintroduction into the magical world to his advantage. The publicity would also be his shield against Dumbledore and Fudge in case they decided to act personally in a more direct manner. After he was finished with his late-night brainwashing, the site was cleaned up, the targets returned to their sleep, and Chad was off to visit Ollivander to select the best materials for his custom wand. The process was rather simple and over in 30 minutes. Chad was once again baffled why all wands were not custom-built if a few spells and handling some materials was all it took. In the end, Chad waited for a couple of hours while watching Ollivander construct the wand to his specific demands, he was taking no chances. The finished product was a 14-inch ash wood with a dragon heartstring core. The handle had been shaped for better grip but was not decorated in any way. He preferred functional over appearance, especially if mishandling your wand could lead to your death. The Ministry's trace was left on the wand as Chad wanted it to be legitimate, he had plenty of others if he needed to cast a spell while remaining incognito. It was also the one that was registered to the Ministry, there would be no links to Voldemort that could be used against him. 
Rita Skeeter interviews Harry Potter. During a lunch break, I was walking in Diagon Alley when I bumped into a small child with round glasses dressed in muggle rags. Thinking him a needy muggle-born child, I was about to give him a sickle for ice cream when I was surprised by his polite apology. I'm sorry, madam, I was not looking where I was going. Are you okay? It was then that I took a closer look at the child and noticed a lightning bolt scar on his forehead. I could only stare in horror as the savior of the wizarding world, heir to the noble and most ancient house of Potter, descended from Ignotus Peveril, one of the three brothers mentioned in the tale of the three brothers, stood before me looking like a muggle beggar child. How was this possible? Was it a disguise to move around incognito? Are you Harry Potter? Why are you dressed in rags? I couldn't help but ask, this was possibly the most talked about child in wizarding history. Yes, madam. These are the only clothes I have other than my Hogwarts robes, and I don't want to get them dirty. The boy politely replied. How could this be? The house of Potter was quite wealthy, could his guardian not even afford proper clothes for the future lord? As a journalist, I could not resist a scoop such as this, but as a witch that benefited from this boy's noble actions, I felt obligated to try and get to the bottom of this mystery and help him as much as I could. As an apology for bumping into the poor deer while he walked wide-eyed through the alley, I suggested some ice cream to make it up to the obviously hungry boy as I asked about his life. My fellow readers, I asked those with bad tempers to stop reading, as what I found out filled me with rage. Harry Potter, the boy who defeated, he who must not be named, had only found out he was a wizard one month ago on his 11th birthday. He never received any mail from his adoring fans and well-wishers. He did not even know there was a whole series of children books about him and his obviously fictional adventures, nor receive any money from it. He knew nothing about our world and had been raised by magic-hating muggles. He didn't even know what his parents looked like and only recently found out how they died, believing what his so-called guardians had told him, that they were the drunken layabouts that died in a muggle automobile accident. This was also how he thought he received his famous scar. I am ashamed to say that I cursed in front of the child. Then I vowed that I would get to the bottom of this travesty. What had me confused was his retelling of the best day of his life, when Hagrid, the groundskeeper of Hogwarts, appeared to personally deliver Mr. Potter's letter after hundreds had been sent, but kept from him by his caretakers. Didn't a head of house professor deliver Hogwarts letters to children in the muggle world, I couldn't help but think to myself. The letters were obviously magical, he spoke with childish innocence, they even knew I lived in the cupboard under the stairs. Once again, I could only stare in disbelief as the naive boy showed me his Hogwarts letter, keeping it on him at all times just in case everything was a dream. Did he not realize that he was being severely mistreated? I wondered. After that shocking fact was revealed, I could not help but dig further. Harry Potter had been treated no better than a house elf. He was excited to go to Hogwarts to escape his captors, not to learn magic. Why has the Ministry of Magic given the savior of the wizarding Britain to magic-hating muggles to be raised as a house elf? Surely a magical family could have taken him in to give him a decent wizard upbringing. There were a couple questions I could not help but ask myself. What of his godparents? What did the Potter will say about his chosen guardians? Did the ministry even care when they threw away our savior like he was trash? Which ministry official delivered a one-year-old baby to a muggle house with no toys or keepsakes of his deceased parents? Why was he never told about his heritage or checked up on? Or was there a darker and more sinister plot afoot? Harry Potter was told that he was hidden in the muggle world to protect him from, you know, who, and his Death Eater sympathizers. But we all know that is a lie, as we were assured that, he was dead and that every Death Eater was in Azkaban. If there is still a threat to Harry Potter's life, what is being done to protect him? What are the Aurors doing if they let a child live in fear for his life since finding out he has been hidden from his heritage and placed with muggles because they failed their job? I asked the brave little wizard how he had managed to find the courage to venture out in public when he was in danger. Diagon Alley is too amazing to visit only once. I could not look around properly last time as we had to shop for my school things. This time, I wanted to explore more before I have to travel to Hogwarts. Even the extra chores I will have to do to pay for the travel fare or the threat of the people that killed my parents, cannot stop me from visiting this magical world. I could not stop the tears that fell from my eyes as I stared at this child with the weight of the world on his shoulders, yet walked tall. After hearing such a heartbreaking story of poor Harry's life, I knew that I had to help him even if the ministry wouldn't. I guided the poor child to my secret potion master, the same one that supplied my permanent modified beautification potion. I had him brew potions to fix his malnourished body and reveal his beautiful green eyes from behind those atrocious glasses. 
The two pictures below, before and after treatment, show just how abused Harry Potter was. The polite and noble child that he was, he immediately suggested that he use his recently found trust fund to pay me back in thanks, but I couldn't allow him to do that. This child deserves more than just potions to fix the mistakes of our government made that caused his suffering. He needed our help to give him justice. Dear readers, we must support this child that has lost everything to save us. We must demand answers from the ministry about how this was allowed to happen. I know only one thing, my faithful readers, I am furious. And I will not rest until I get that boy the life he deserves. By Rita Skeeter. Today was the day that most 11-year-old wizard and witches looked forward to the most. The day they traveled to Hogwarts. Chad, however, was merely interested in how events would unfold after his first strike against the Ministry and Dumbledore would go today. The Daily Prophet sent out its newspaper at 7 a.m. sharp, but the Hogwarts Express didn't leave until 11 a.m. This was a potentially dangerous time for Chad as Dumbledore could decide to take a more forceful approach to his sacrifice's personality and do damage control. For this reason, Chad had made sure Vernon was driving him around London in an attempt to throw off Dumbledore's teleporting slash Phoenix travel or make him decide to play the long game. Cannon had him taking the adverse publicity head-on without caring. Hopefully, he would also deem the situation unworthy of acting. Besides, Chad had made sure Rita aimed mostly at the Ministry of Magic with only a mention of Hagrid and the Hogwarts letter delivery. Vernon dropped him off at King's Cross Station at 10.30 a.m., giving him half an hour to witness the Weasley show and catch the train. He was curious if Mrs. Weasley would actually say what was in the book. Not knowing which platform the Hogwarts Express was at, the only magical train in the station, after five of her children had attended and two had graduated, was ridiculous. Not to mention that she must have ridden the train to Hogwarts herself. Sure enough, at 10 minutes to 11, a mob of redheads came barreling down the path, late for the train. Chad stood a few meters away under a disillusionment charm to watch the spectacle. Packed with muggles, of course. The speaker was a plump woman who was talking to four boys, all with flaming red hair, each of them pushing a trolley carrying a trunk. There was even an owl in a cage on one of them. Chad had sent Lilith off to make her own way to Hogwarts as she didn't like being cooped up in a cage. Now, what's the platform number, said Mrs. Weasley. Nine and three quarters, piped a small girl, who was holding her hand, Mom, can't I go? You're not old enough, Ginny, now be quiet. All right, Percy, you go first. Percy walked into the seemingly solid wall and disappeared. Fred, you next, the plump woman said. I'm not Fred, I'm George, said the boy. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. Can't you tell I'm George? Sorry, George, dear. Only joking, I am Fred. These two jokers were the only Weasley children at Hogwarts that Chad liked in the books, hopefully, that was also accurate now he was living alongside them. He watched as the red-headed woman looked around a bit frantically, obviously not finding what she was searching for. Wait a minute, Ron, there are too many muggles around at the moment. Mrs. Weasley said, raising her voice when using the word muggles. Chad laughed to himself as he walked through the wall before them to arrive at platform 9 and 3 quarters, still invisible. There would be no innocent meeting that would create an opening for friendship today. But Chad's silent laughter stopped immediately at the scene in front of him. There was a scarlet steam engine waiting next to a platform packed with people. The problem was that there was a group of official-looking people that could only be Aurors. They also looked worried. Knowing that they could only be there in response to the article in today's paper, he could only curse at himself for the change in plans. He thought it was bad enough that he had to paint himself as a poor, deprived and abused orphan to get the media train pointed at Dumbledore and the Ministry. He had not thought about the repercussions other than Dumbles attacking him for a personality change. Still, he could also use this to his advantage, he just had to play it right. The rest of the Weasley family came through the portal, and only his quick reflexes prevented a collision and his subsequent discovery. Pulling his shrunken trunk from his pocket, he made it full size as he released his invisibility on himself, hopefully making it look like he had dragged his trunk through the magical portal. Everyone still on the platform turned their disappointed gases from the red-headed family to him with eager eyes. Um. Hello. He nervously said under the combined scrutiny of everyone. Luckily he was dressed as a noble and not under an illusion of a skinny glasses-wearing slave. Thanks to Skeeter, he now had an excuse for his full-grown appearance, even if it was a little weak. A portly little man wearing a bottle green suit, with a lime green bowler hat covering his gray hair, pushed through the group of Aurors. 
A severe-looking matron with a close-cropped gray hair and a monocle also broke off from the group and approached him. Chad put on his best childish innocent face and mentally prepared some questions to get the conversation moving in the right direction. Harry Potter, such a pleasure to meet you. I am Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic. Said the excitable little man. And I'm Amelia Bones, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. We are here to put your mind at ease and assure you that you are not in any danger. She interrupted Fudge before he could go off on a tangent. We understand that you met a witch that may have exaggerated your circumstances a little, and we wanted to put your mind at ease before you left for Hogwarts. Thank you Madam Bones. To be honest, I was not sure what to think. A month ago I was just plain old, Harry the Freak, that lived in the cupboard under the stairs thanks to my aunt and uncle's charity. Then all those letters and owls came, and suddenly I'm a wizard. Miss Skeeter was kind enough to fill me in on my family situation and fix my health problems, I really can't thank her enough for her help. I only have a couple of questions to ask if I may. Chad started with the pitiful orphan routine to start things off and hopefully garner some sympathy to soften any mistakes he may accidentally make. Sure, that's what we are here for. But you ended up coming rather late. How about a few quick questions and a photo for the press, then we can follow up anything else at a later date. What say you, Amelia? Fudge jumped in to hurry things along, there was a train full of children waiting after all, and he didn't need them to hear about the dreadful childhood of their hero. A rather chilly look was aimed at the Minister of Magic by Mrs. Bones, but she nodded her head in acknowledgement. It was five minutes to eleven o'clock and would only cause more problems to hold up the train. Yeah, sorry about that. Hagrid forgot to mention how to get to the platform, and if it wasn't for some red-headed woman shouting about muggles and how to get to platform nine and three quarters, I wouldn't have found it. There are only a few urgent questions I have and will be more than happy to visit the Ministry of Magic on school break to clear anything else up later. Seeing a nod from the two highest-ranking ministry officials, Chad continued. The first is if the Dark Lord is really gone. And do I have to fear any retaliation from his supporters? I really don't want to have to continue hiding in the muggle world. Absolutely not Harry, I assure you that all of those Cretans were captured and you have nothing to worry about. Frankly, we are not sure why you were hidden away to start with, and Amelia has started an investigation into how this happened. Supplied Fudge, ever fearful of Voldemort and his lackeys. It was hilarious that his most trusted advisor was in Voldemort's inner circle. Thank you, Minister, that's good to know. But do you think I could get something to send an alarm to the Aurors if my life is in danger? That would help me rest easy if I knew I could summon someone if I was ever attacked. Of course Harry, that is an excellent idea. Replied Madame Bones, taking out a business card with her ministry title and office location. She then pulled out her wand and cast a few spells. The only one Chad recognized was the protean charm, he would have to investigate the others later on the train. There you go, she said as she handed the card to him, just tear that when you are in danger, and I will send an auror team to your location. So it also had a way to track him. Well, it would be perfect for when he was at Hogwarts. Now to settle his property. His new tax office minion had already informed him that Godric's Hollow had been preserved in its ruined state as a monument to the Potters. His grandparents' manor had been destroyed when Voldemort could not find them when they were under the Fidelius charm, and there were two magical ingredient farms. The land with the manor ruins had remained untouched, but there was a bit of inconsistency regarding the two farms. They had continued to pay taxes, but there was no evidence of any payments into the Potters' Gringotts vault. Next was if there was any will and last testament of Lily and James Potter. If there was any mention of his godparents or the invisibility cloak would go a long way to slapping Dumbledore in the face. Sirius was still in Azkaban, but now that Chad had officially entered the magical world, he could get him out. The cloak was also hopefully mentioned somewhere as there was no guarantee that Dumbles would still hand it over now that he had to do damage control. Dumbledore having the Potter's invisibility cloak while they were attacked would be a PR nightmare for him. Rita would be able to propose all kinds of what-if scenarios like would they still be alive if they had it. The hurried conversation listing out his concerns were noted down, and he received nods and smiles to placate him. For now, they were great places to start having the ministry look into, and a short conversation with Fudge and Bones had them promising to do just that for him. Then there was a quick photo opportunity for Fudge and Bones to be seen supporting the wizarding hero, a quick statement saying how thankful he was for everyone's support, and then he was ushered onto the waiting train. With a wave goodbye to the ministry representatives, the Scarlet Steam Engine pulled away from the station. Five minutes behind schedule was unnoticed by the students as they talked excitedly about their holidays or going to Hogwarts for the first time. 
Chad found one of the several empty compartments and put his trunk away in the overhead storage rack, the featherlight charm making it easy. It was only a couple minutes later when the door of the compartment slid open, and the youngest red-headed boy came in. Anyone sitting there? He asked, pointing at the seat opposite Harry. Everywhere else is full. Knowing that Ron was trying to find an excuse to sit with the boy who lived, Chad humored him. Sure, have a seat. The twins never made an appearance thanks to the unexpected visit from the ministry, so Ron was left to introduce himself. I'm Ron by the way, Ron Weasley. Harry Potter. Are you really, Harry Potter? Ron blurted out. Chad nodded, playing along. There was zero chance that Ron didn't already know his identity. He had been standing in front of the train talking to the Minister of Magic and head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement after all. Have you really got, you know? He pointed at Harry's forehead. Chad couldn't help but look at Ron weirdly. Even though he knew it was coming, it was still shocking that Ron would actually ask about what was potentially a touchy subject like it was nothing. Chad decided to mess with him. Are you asking if I still carry the scar from when the Dark Lord killed my parents and then tried to kill me? That, you know. Watching the idiot child go red with embarrassment, Chad then threw him off balance by raising his fringe and revealing the faded lightning bolt scar. Yeah, it's still there. But it has faded a fair bit. He could have removed it entirely but chose to keep it as it was the symbol everyone knew him for. Besides, it was kind of cool. What followed was a bit of an awkward silence as the train carried them out of London. Before it could become unbearable, the compartment door was thrown open once again. Three boys entered, and Chad recognized them by who was at the front of the group. Is it true? Malfoy said. They're saying all down the train that Harry Potter's in this compartment. So it's you, is it? Yes, Chad answered, he supposed he should start referring to himself as Harry now that he was on his way to Hogwarts. It would be good practice and save himself from any slip-ups by accidentally introducing himself as Chad instead of Harry. He glanced at the two minions, both of them were thick-set and looked extremely mean-looking, probably trained to do so. They were standing on either side of Malfoy like bodyguards. Oh, this is Crab, and this is Goyle, said the pale boy carelessly, noticing where Harry was looking. And my name's Malfoy, Draco Malfoy. Ron gave a slight cough, which might have been hiding a snigger. Draco Malfoy looked at him. Think my name's funny, do you? No need to ask who you are. My father told me all the Weasleys have red hair, freckles, and more children than they can afford. Harry couldn't help the short laugh that escaped. For an 11-year-old, that was a pretty good burn, and it looked like it hit home if Ron's blushing was any indicator. He turned back to Harry. You'll soon find out some wizarding families are much better than others, Potter. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. He held out his hand to shake Harry's, and Harry shook it. Malfoy had made a better first impression than Ron, and it couldn't hurt to be polite. Pleasure to meet you. But please take it easy on Ron, I have only just met him, but he seems harmless enough if a bit blunt. Harry politely asked. With a sneer at the blushing redhead, Malfoy gave a nod and sat down next to Harry. Crab and Goyle sat down beside Ron, doing their best to look as menacing as their 11-year-old features would allow. What followed was a 20-minute polite introductory into pure-blood politics and who the notables in their year were. Of course, there was the Slytherin recruitment pitch thrown in also. Thank you, Draco. This has been most enlightening. While I don't really care for blood status, since I am told my mother was muggle-born, I certainly see the benefit in discovering the noble traditions and customs since I am heir to the House of Potter. I fear I am destined for Ravenclaw since I have much to learn and little time to do it, thanks to being kidnapped and placed with muggles. I have heard of the legendary feud between Slytherin and Gryffindor and would prefer to watch from the sidelines since I can't afford to split my attention. Perhaps we could meet up on a day off, and you can bring me up to speed on what I need to learn first. He replied as posh as he could, not sounding very childlike. Being raised with a noble upbringing, Malfoy knew a polite conversational conclusion when he heard it. The timing was perfect as there was a clattering outside in the corridor, and a smiling, dimpled woman slid back their door. Anything off the cart, dears? It was a pleasure meeting you, Harry. Send me an owl when you wish for those lessons. Announced Draco as he collected his minions. Friendly nods were given all around, except for Ron, as they filed past the old woman. Harry hit the snack lady up for some wizard sweets, but he stayed away from the Betty Bot's every flavor beans and the chocolate frogs. As much as he liked chocolate, he wasn't quite ready to experience eating something still alive, even if it was just an enchantment. 
As everyone had left and Harry admired his pile of sweets, Ron exploded with the outrage he had been bottling up since Malfoy shut him down. How could you Harry, they are slimy snakes. There's not a witch or wizard that went bad that wasn't in Slytherin. He shouted in outrage. God, this idiot was annoying. At least Malfoy had the good manners to leave when Harry wanted him to, which was somewhat surprising. He chewed on his cauldron cakes hoping Ron would finish his sermon quickly. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.